Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. I'm Christina Suzama, and with me is our brilliant medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. Hello, Glenn. Greetings, and welcome everyone to Magical Medical Tour. I'm Dr. Glenn Wallman, and I'll be your medical guide today as we go through the medical healthcare galaxy searching for ways to optimal health. How's your week, Christina? It's been fantastic, Glenn. Thank you so much. It's uh, been a really cool ebb and flow these days as uh, this year of the dragon takes us further into the year. I hear that a lot of people have been really, really tired this past week. What's that about? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're just working hard. Yeah. I don't know. Or this wonderful hey, overcast weather that we keep getting here in Los Angeles. I don't know about you there in Santa Barbara. I consider every day a season. So it's the rainy season, the day it rains, and when it's sunny out, it's summer, and when the flowers are out, it's spring. I don't know. We have different seasons every day here. Practically, <laughs> but I like it. It's yeah, fun that way. Yeah, it's 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 good, but it's messing with our lighting all the time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's another world. Uh, from a painter's point of view or an artist's point of view, sometimes that's the best lighting. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, right. Well, it's okay. It softens the lines and the wrinkles. It's good. <laughs> That's funny. I, I, I'm thinking I want to do a little uh, word association uh, journey with you today. I was thinking I would call it an experiment, but you might react to that or a test. So I figured a journey you would like. Journey, so I want to do a word association <laughs> journey with you. Uh-huh. What's so I'll say up word. today? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, so I will say a word and whatever comes into mind, uh, just one word quickly, just say it if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. Food. Mm, fruit. Nutrition. Diet. Diet. Weight. Fast food. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could think of another word that, that could top that. Uh, these, <laughs> these are all words uh, based on our guest today, um, who's Dr. John LaPuma. He's a uh, chef MD, and um, I thought he would be really good to speak to today because food for all of us is something uh, very personal. Many times from just as, uh, one point of view, it, it appeals to so many senses. There's the artistic point with the presentation, and there's sensory input from tastes and textures and spices. Then we get into another category of food, which has to do with nutrition. And in that area, we think about you know the proteins and carbohydrates and fats and micronutrients. And then we start getting into the... Um, industrial corporate complex of of food and at that point we uh, get a lot of information that comes to us at all times and it's difficult to figure out sometimes what's good what's bad what's a hit what's a myth uh, and hopefully today uh, I'm going to use a, a uh, cooking term I hope Dr. Uh, La Puma will clarify a lot of these issues for us. So Dr. John LaPuma is uh, an author. He's written a number of books. He's co-authored a number of books. He does TV shows for PBS, and he's started a clinic, a nutritional medicine clinic in Santa Barbara. He works as a chef MD, and I would like to present him to you and to our audience today. Mm -hmm. Welcome, John. Thanks so much, Glenn. How are you? I'm doing great. It's good to uh, hear your voice. It's fun to be with you. Thanks for having me. Dr. LaPuma, a man of my heart, a doctor as well as a chef. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> John, normally with, with my uh, audience here, I usually, as a medical guide, try to tell them the path we're going to be on. But I think in today's case, in honor of you, rather than a path, uh, I'd like to present uh, everyone with a recipe for today. 
So I think in terms of the concept of the recipe and the way we'll go on our little journey for the next 45 to 50 minutes, we'll start with how we chose a meal and the recipe itself. We'll get into a little bit of prep work. Uh, we'll get into some of the uh, things to do in the kitchen. Then we'll talk about the entree, which is your medical nutritional institute and your chef MD program. Uh, we'll have a couple of side dishes. And then we'll end with some dessert, a dessert of your choice. How's that sound? Uh, I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So hopefully at the end of this, uh, everyone will also be hungry, but eating the right foods and the right proportions and everything. So let's start with the recipe itself. You know, when a chef decides they're going to prepare something, they sit back and think, what, what was the recipe for uh, a person that, started out, became a doctor, became an internal medicine doctor, and then became a chef. Tell us uh, how that recipe was created. Um, well, I've always had very good teachers, Glenn. Uh, and um, some of my best teachers were actually right here in Santa Barbara. We're both privileged to live in this beautiful community. And I uh, grew up here as a... Uh, son of um, two parents, Italian-American parents, who cared deeply about food uh, as not only part of sustenance, but also uh, um, really uh, about love and nurture. And so my parents actually were some of my first and best teachers about the value of food and, um, and also about the value of health. I was encouraged very early to um, explore my interest in health and um, have been working in hospitals for since I was actually 15 years old. Um, and as I went through medicine, it seemed to me that um, during that course, not enough attention was paid to individual stories. And so I developed an interest in medical ethics and um, did the first uh, graduate course, postgraduate course in the, in the country as a fellowship at the University of Chicago in clinical medical ethics, where I help people resolve dilemmas near the end of life, primarily because I think I was able to tell their stories well and help other clinicians make good decisions about them. But it was such a encompassing and broadly uh, demanding work uh, that uh, I um, didn't use any of the tools that I'd learned about stress management and um, gained a lot of weight and didn't take care of myself. Um, and realized that I needed to do better with that. And so I actually got off the fast track a little bit and went to cooking school to learn how to make a healthy diet taste good and to keep the weight off that I had lost eating rice crackers and grapefruit uh, for four months to, wow. to lose it. And when I went back to medical practice, I uh, was fortunate to uh, meet uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Mike Royzen, who is now the chief wellness officer at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, and advisor to the Dr. Oz show. And together we um, developed the Real Age Diet series, the Cooking the Real Age Way and the Real Age Diet, mm -hmm. Make Yourself Younger with What You Eat, and began to think and uh, speak with people directly, knowing that medicine um, had not yet made room for the idea that physicians can and ought to become expert in nutrition in a way that was publicly facing. Um, so I have found myself again now, and this is really, it brings us to the present, uh, in a position to tell stories that I have not actually been able to tell uh, um, about the success of people who do, in fact, take control of their lives with what they eat and find a place of control that they had not been able to find previously. And with that, I think... Um, I tie it back to the the notion of ethics and choice, and that's what cooking and and um, the study of ethics have in common. They're really both about choice, as is, I think, health in many cases. Oh, that's a nice journey uh, that you're on now. I'd like to. I'd like. To, there's so many questions when people heard that I was going to be speaking to you. There, there were many questions that came up that just really practical, simple questions in terms of 
you know, just being in a kitchen, even after you've chosen the foods, but uh, in the kitchen, when you start out cooking, and that's what you talk about a lot, what's the what's the best thing to cook with? I hear, you know, I watch a TV commercial that says Teflon, nonstick, coating, do this, use this type of skillet or something like that. What what should we use that, that won't harm us? I, I like um, natural materials. I mean, uh, I use... Um, I use a cast iron skillet that's well seasoned. I use uh, stainless steel equipment. I try not to use aluminum, uh, but occasionally I do. Um, I try not to let uh, perfect be um, override good. I think perfect can be the enemy of good. And I think anything that gets people cooking is great, whether it's a bamboo steamer or, um, uh, you know, my six and a half quart all clad Dutch oven, which I use for as much as I can to a simple pot that you find at a thrift store that, um, uh, those are some of my best finds. Actually, I had the same ceramic, um, um, roasting dish that I had, uh, in medical school, um, that I still use because I love it. Mm. So I don't like to let the kind of pot or pan or spoon or spatula get in the way of actually getting into the kitchen. There is a, there are best choices and I think they probably are stainless steel and wood. Um, but I think that anything you have is good to cook with. That's a, that's a relief. I like that. Uh, on all the, recipes now with of things that come in boxes or cans they give uh information on how to cook it in the oven or the microwave uh do you ever use a microwave i do i i don't own one currently but um that's because i just moved and um i'm on an extended camping trip um at least that's how it feels like uh, uh i think microwaves are great they're great for steaming vegetables they're great for um, reheating coffee. They're great for uh, all kinds of simple steaming and um, boiling things. I have never been able to trace the scientific um, uh, allegations that uh, microwaves are bad for your brain. I, I, once in a while when I give a public talk, I, I talk about microwaving something and that's almost inevitably raised but every time i look in the medical literature or in the scientific literature i can't find any studies in people that indicate that it's a bad thing or for that matter in animals mm -hmm. um, there were early studies of microwaves and pacemakers as you're well aware um, right. but um, uh, that problem was resolved i think in the 1970s so I, I think the microwave is a good thing. I think if it gets you to cook, it's even better. Mm -hmm. I, I sort of agree. I, I have to say um, uh, some of the, the top chefs in, in Hong Kong had taught me to steam my fish in the microwave, <clears throat> which at first I thought was sacrilegious. You know, <laughs> it's like steaming fish. But it, it really does, the, the, the flavors and all just sort of blend together just beautifully. So as long as you know how to, it's it's almost an art form cooking with a microwave, isn't it? I, it's the great, it's the best thing for steaming. I know I like it for fish. It's mm -hmm. very, it treats fish very gently. Um, um, I'm I'm all for it. And, it's and all you, good. And you don't feel it takes any of the nutritional value away from the foods? No, I think that's mostly a myth. There there are some foods that are actually enhanced in nutritional value with uh with cooking the the fiber in vegetables for example becomes more bioavailable it's more easily uh digested when it is cooked the, the vitamin a in carrots is also more bioavailable when they're cooked than when they're raw um the vitamin c in corn the same way mm -hmm. uh, um 
these are microscopic differences, but they're biochemically accurate. Yeah. So I think um, the the real potential problem is that if I mean if you're boiling Brussels sprouts in the microwave, and some people will, um, first of all they'll sell they'll smell sulfuric pretty quickly. All those sulfur molecules come out, and it'll be kind of unpleasant. But if you um, then toss the water which you might be tempted to do because you probably shouldn't boil Brussels sprouts in the microwave to begin with, then um, out go all the water-soluble vitamins, all the B vitamins and the, and the C vitamins. Um, so I try to reuse uh, water and uh, cooking waters and cooking liquids whenever I can because you recapture the vitamins and you often add a layer of complexity um, uh, in flavor that is interesting. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, that's good to know. That's that. That's a. Uh, I'm I'm glad to hear that positive feedback about microwaving because, again, we hear so much about about the microwaves and how it's uh, it changes the food and um, how it's not good for us. And I, I I always wonder if it's what happens to the food inside the microwave or what the microwave as a unit is giving off that affects us. Yeah, you know. I am afraid that a lot of that is just woo-woo stuff. It's <laughs> not really science-based that I can find. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm happy to look at any scientific study that somebody sends me. You can do it through drjohnlacuma.com. I'm happy to look at peer-reviewed science that is about how microwave changes food in an undesirable way. But frankly, um, I think we've had a 50-year test, and I don't see any either epidemiologic or public health or um, meta-analysis you know, studies that show us that there have been any danger. And mm. frankly, I think it's such a convenient tool that um, I like it as an introduction. I also like it for children mm -hmm. to, to just have the pleasure of pressing the button on the microwave and watching the carousel go around. Um, and having the light go on when, when you open the door. I mean, I think these things are magical. Mm -hmm. And it, it's part of how the excitement of cooking can be introductory for people who um, are use their ovens to store hats otherwise. <laughs> I could see another um, uh, exhibit at Disneyland, Microwave World, for all the kids maybe coming up. Hey, what I, about? I, just think, um, I think anything that gets people in the kitchen is a good thing. That's true. Uh, what about oils? We hear so much about oils now. Cooking oils, I'm talking about. Uh, you know, what are the, what are the best oils to cook with and to put on your salads? And what are the worst oils? Are there good fats in these oils and omega threes? All of all of the oil uh, literature is coming out right now. Clear it up for us. Um, the best oils to cook with are generally oils that are liquid at room temperature because then they stay liquid inside of you. Um, I like cooking with olive oil because it's got centuries of and possibly millennia of uh, history. Um, I like dressing with nut and seed oils, particularly mm. sesame and walnut and macadamia. Um, uh, because they're highly flavorful and you only need a little bit. Um, for um, at about 350, 370, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil begins to smoke. And at about 410, it has a flash point where it can erupt into flame. And uh, when that happens, uh, uh, more free radicals are created, which are... Um, can corrode the inside of your arteries. So it's said that you ought not to high temperature cook with um, extra virgin olive oil, but instead ought to use peanut oil or even coconut oil mm -hmm. to um, cook at very high temperatures because you can get up to 450 or 500 and not have it smoke or flash. Um, there is probably some truth to that. There probably is truth to cooking at really high temperatures with coconut or peanut or um, 
or another, even grapeseed oils, all of which have high smoke and flash points. And dressing with the delicate flavors of dark sesame and walnut and other seed oils, and of course, extra virgin olive oil again. Um, I think if I had only one oil to choose, it would probably be extra virgin olive oil because it uh, it is so versatile and time tested. I also like canola oil, and I think there's some lots of controversy about that as well. The erucic acid in it's supposed to be toxic, and it is in the uh, in the uh, older forms of canola, um, which are not usually grown commercially anymore, just for that reason. Uh, canola has been hybridized. It's Canadian oil. That's the where we get canola. Um, and uh, in a way so that the toxins are removed. So uh, I think that's also a good choice. Um, um, the oils I think that are not good choices are are tend to be very high in uh, omega-6s, which we get too much of in, in the American diet. Um, uh, safflower and corn, um, uh, sunflower seed, and of course, oils that are partially hydrogenated, those that are high in trans fats. Um, which you see in shortening uh, uh, and in some margarine still. Um, uh, they've been largely taken out of uh, processed foods because of their uh, damaging uh, effect on the inside of arteries, their increase in heart disease and stroke risk, and, uh, and that's a good thing. Palm oils have been substituted for them, which are otherwise saturated, uh, but there's better and better evidence that saturated fat, uh, particularly from vegetable sources, is not as um, evil as it has been painted in the risk for heart disease. Mm. And in fact, um, there is some data to suggest, particularly for men who are low in testosterone, that um, food high in saturated fat is actually important or a reasonable component of their diet because it helps them make testosterone, which is a surprisingly deficient in men in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. And then finally, um, fish oil, which we should mention as omega-3s. Uh, omega-3s are not really good to cook with, per se, because they oxidize too quickly. But um, the omega-3s that are from cold water marine fish, uh, tuna and... Um, salmon and trout and sardines and herring and mackerel, uh, not king mackerel or swordfish or tilefish, all of which are, a lot of three of which are high in mercury. Uh, these data are available at uh, the USDA.gov and through the Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, and, uh, and other uh, important groups that rank fish on the basis of their sustainability and healthfulness. Um, um, Omega-3s are important to, to eat, I think, um, through food as maybe even more importantly than in fish, uh, than in pill form, excuse me. Um, if you don't eat fish, you can get the omega-3 through, through pills, of course, but I think then you miss out on many of the other nutrients in fish, particularly small fish, which are uh, really important and, and I think also are ones that we may not even know the names of yet. That's how complex and interesting fishes. Mm. Um, so I, I hope that's a short, helpful primer on, on the importance of oils in food. Basically, uh, fat has been sold as a bad thing, but it's not. Fat is actually good for you because it carries flavor. It carries vitamins D, E, A, and K, which are only soluble in fat. And because um, it's fun to cook with and be around. Mm. And what about butter? I like butter. I don't know many people who don't. Um, I I think there's an argument that uh, natural grass-fed cows produce butter that's terrifically sweet and um, and flavorful. And I buy that argument. I, I like butter as a um, uh, as an occasional condiment where you can see it. Um, butter baked into bread, butter um, baked into crusts, especially butter folded into things, I think 
takes away what it really offers, which is a very delicate, rich flavor. And um, if you fold it into mashed potatoes or uh, almost anything else that is mashed or whipped or pureed or um, uh, otherwise encapsulates it, I think you lose what its very specialness in both flavor and in um, texture. Mm. But so I'm an advocate of if you use butter, I think you it ought to be visible. You ought to have a tiny pat on top of roasted asparagus. You ought to have a uh, a small dollop um, on on top of another grilled vegetable. You you should not hide it on the inside of a sandwich. I think um, uh, because it is very calorie dense, I'd like to have people see it and know that they're eating it and and enjoy it. The same is true, by the way, for a lot of oils, um, particularly as I've mentioned, extra virgin and sesame and walnut and others, where it ought to be drizzled over the top of something instead of um, uh, baked or or um, uh, mixed within it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm getting hungry thinking of all these foods. <laughs> I had substituted walnut oil for soy oil in a, in a cupcake the other day. It was a chocolate cupcake. And I got to tell you, that, that flavor of walnut that came through with the chocolate was just unbelievable. <laughs> it is. I, uh, walnut's marvelous. We're lucky to have access to so many terrific seed oils and and yet people ought not to feel that they um uh they can only get that from uh from a specialty oil you mm -hmm. can you can toast a few sesame seeds or a few walnuts and and crumble it into whatever it is that you're drizzling uh walnut oil over and um and uh, and use canola instead and have that um toasted walnut flavor on top of canola uh, instead of uh, the amazing La Tourangelle roasted walnut oil, which I love especially, and um, and and one in the Santa Rita Hills here that uh, is called La Nogalera, mm -hmm. which is my favorite walnut mm -hmm. oil. That's wonderful, um, yes. And we're lucky to have them at the Saturday Farmers Market. You should come and and check oh, it out. Oh, they're here as well in the Hollywood Farmers Market. Mm. That's where there I got go. my last container. <laughs> Uh, Rancho La Vina is is the is the Santa Rita Hill mm. Ranch, uh, and they're they're online and they're terrific. I don't I don't own anything. Um, I'm not getting paid to talk about it. It's just I think they're terrific. Yes, I can agree. I'll second that. <laughs> See what you're missing. I'd Glenn? listen to. It. Yeah, I know. I don't think I'm missing any of this. I uh, I just heard a talk on omega threes, and I, it was always interesting to me because whenever I hear omega threes, they always talk about the fish you should get it in versus krill versus everything. And the the actual talk started with the concept that the omega threes don't come from any of the fish; it comes from an algae, which all of the fish eat. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Mm. Uh, and yeah, that's <laughs> correct. Of course, that's where fish get their omega threes. They eat the <laughs> they eat the species of krill or um, or an algae, and uh, and I think you know we're seeing that krill now harvesting for this. It's the vast majority is harvested for feed for fish farms, but um, but uh, many retailers are now stocking omega threes from krill, which is I suppose even closer to the source. Yeah, interesting. That's right. It, let's get, let's start into the entree now a little bit about what you do at your medical nutritional institute. Uh, we talk about uh, diets. The, there are cultures in India and around the world that practice Ayurvedic diets that have to do with certain body types. We talk about the uh, diet for your blood type. The genome uh, studies are teaching us that there may be diets that really specifically are genetically more appropriate for each of us. Uh, we hear about diets all the time. What, how do you look at diet and what's your thought on the concept of either diet for nutritional purposes and then we'll get into diet for weight loss purposes or weight control? 
Um, let me take that in reverse order. I think the diet for weight control, it can be summarized simply, the best diet is the one that you can stay on. Hmm. So weight control is, I find, as individual as people are, I think there are significant differences between men and women, the foods that are good for men and the foods that are good for women, and the programs and dietary approaches that are good for each. Most dietary programs and books are written for women instead of for men, but it turns out that men need a very different kind of process than women do uh, and have been kind of underserved in this area, in my opinion. Um, and I'm working on that with a program called the Man Plan Diet uh, that um, is also going to be a book out next year uh, by Crown. Uh, and right now we're doing the beta test of the program to see how we can help men. Um, I think for both men and women, um, the best diet is the one that you can stay on. The the former question, which is how what's the best approach to to healthy eating, perhaps overall, if I can rephrase that a little bit, um, I think it is one that is that diet that eating is fundamentally cultural mm -hmm. that we we in america have many different cultures so we're lucky to have many different cultures and if you go from latino to asian to um to african american within to uh native american you see dozens of variations within each and from an eater standpoint it's very exciting because there's a lot to eat and a lot to sample. And I just think it's kind of like Disneyland. <laughs> um, on the other hand, if you want to eat healthfully overall, it, it's maybe the most useful thing I could say is that um, eating minimally processed food, food is, that is as close to, as it can be to its natural state, which I would include uh, not necessarily raw food, but instead food that is reasonably cooked um, because it does increase uh, bioavailability of some nutrients and allows you to digest it more easily, um, not improve flavor and texture, uh, then you should. So eating a diet that is minimally processed is, I think, one easy guideline. Another easy nutritional guideline is to, um, and this is also true for weight control, but it, it has to do with the cultural and social and aesthetic aspect of eating, is to sit down when you eat. I know that sounds kind of simplistic, but if you watch how people eat in our country, you know, we eat just about everywhere, first of all, and um, and in almost every position, <laughs> horizontal, vertical, um, on our side, uh, sitting. And if you sit when you eat and you have a plate in front of you, um, preferably with utensils and a tall, narrow glass, because people drink less from a tall, narrow glass than from a short, fat one, um, <laughs> then you, you increase the potential for enjoyment of your meal. And I think enjoyment in, in diet, especially not necessarily weight loss, although I think it's important there, but I'm now addressing the former question. Enjoyment of food ought to be at the very base of the USDA's food pyramid, not 11 servings of grains or whatever it is, um, but instead um, enjoy your food. People, I think, don't take time, and that's the resource that's in short of supply to um to use their senses around food to smell to taste to touch even to listen um to food cooking it's very very entertaining and quite absorbing if you pay close attention as many cooks do to how food is being prepared and then what it looks like and sounds like and smells like once it's on the plate so those are the simplest and I and maybe the most useful things I can say. 
I like people whenever they can to sit with a plate in front of them and to to and use their senses to enjoy their food. And from a, a dietary or a weight management standpoint, I think um, again, men and women have significant differences, um, and and I think that whatever has been has worked for you is likely to work for you again. I don't remember ever sitting when I was working in the emergency department and eating at the time. For many years, it was like that. John, you said something subtle that I want to uh, ask you about. You talked about the shape of a glass being tall and thin. And I'm wondering if uh, you're getting at the concept of that people should not drink too much and dilute uh, with water or anything else while they're eating so their digestive enzymes can work more effectively? Or am I in a completely different uh, galaxy there? Um, what I was referring to is the behavioral research that uh, Brian Wansink has, and others have done at Cornell. Uh, in, and he's recorded in a couple of popular books, one called Mindless Eating, um, in which... Uh, he suggests and has done studies to show that if you drink from tall, narrow glasses, it's a little bit more difficult to get your nose in the glass, to um, to manipulate it towards your mouth, to um, uh, to physically handle it than it is to to use a short, fat glass where it's much easier to get um, to access the liquid, and that's because. Uh, many liquids, in fact, all liquids that are not thick, are don't add to satiety or the feeling of being full and fully satisfied. Um, the exception is 600 milliliters, which is what it takes approximately a very thick liquid, smoothie type of liquid, um, which does expand the bottom of your uh, pylorus, that little valve that leads from your stomach to your small intestine that um, triggers the release of the chemical that tells your brain that your stomach has had enough and um, then allows you to realize that you ought to, that you're beginning to feel full and should stop eating. And of course, it's very different than to, um, to not feel hungry and to know that you've had enough. Those are different sensations. And many people need to learn that they've had enough because they don't, aren't going to feel physically full. Because liquids aren't sati aren't satiating, don't add to this feeling of being full and uh, pleasantly full. Um, I like people who are drinking liquids that have calories, particularly juices, to um, to use a tall, narrow glass because um, they'll appreciate it more. They'll eat. They'll drink a little more slowly, and it will look like more. Both of all three of which are. Um, important behavioral and emotional cues to eating to and drinking uh, and enjoying more, uh, but having a little less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is is there a summer's coming up right now? So it, it, the beach is happening and weddings are happening, and everyone wants to drop some weight uh, to look good in something they're putting on or taking off. Is there some kind of a scale that you can give us that would say it's safe and healthy to lose this amount of pounds within this amount of time? That's an interesting question because I, television has uh, warped this perception. Um, the Biggest Loser and, and shows like it show generally that men and women can lose eight, nine, 10, 12 pounds in a week. Um, and and there's a popular perception that that is not only normal, but uh, attainable in an ordinary way. And it's not, that's a very special circumstance. And, um, and, and so it, I think needs to be kept in mind that the recommendations are one or two pounds a week over the long term allows you to maintain the weight loss. Mm -hmm. However, there's more recent research that suggests that 
people who lose a lot of weight early on have a better chance of keeping it off than people who start a little bit at a time and kind of gradually go down. Mm -hmm. I find, and actually the National Weight Control Registry, which is available uh, through our website uh, at drjohnlapuma.com and also online at nwcr.ns, um, uh, uh, shows that people who do lose weight and keep it off um, adhere to half a dozen habits, which are easily replicable by anyone who is invested in it. And most of it uh, has to do with really simple things. People eat breakfast. People who have lost 55 pounds on average and kept it off for an average of six years do these five things. They eat breakfast every day. They uh, have at least 60 minutes daily of active, purposeful exercise. Um, they sometimes take one day off a week. They regularly watch little television and do not eat in front of the computer or TV. Uh, less than an hour a week, an hour a day, excuse me, of television, which is uh, as opposed to the national average of about four and a half hours. Um, they um, they generally have followed their own weight loss program. Um, they have not been part of a commercial program. Um, um, and they weigh themselves at least once a week. Um, and these simple things allow people to have have steady weight loss and maintain that weight loss. And although these are the things that people do to maintain their weight loss, they also work to lose weight sensibly over time without prescribing a particular loss of one food group or an overdose of raspberry ketones, for example. Speaking of that, uh, combinations of foods. We hear a lot of people talking about you shouldn't have this food on the plate with that kind of food. And in that case, I'm talking more about proteins or carbohydrates and fats. When should you eat the fruit? Should we really be eating dessert at the end of a meal? What's going on? I Let me try to be simple about it. Um, I don't know of a food combination aspect or approach that makes a difference in weight management. Um, the, the theory of food combining, which is supposed to aid in the prevention of certain chronic metabolic diseases, um, is, is just that. It's a theory that uh, has, I think it separates foods into acidic and neutral and alkaline and then there are other theories that are, that divide food at different times of the meal. And um, frankly, I don't really know that. I, I think the advantage to such, let me try to be positive, that the advantage to such diets is that they give people structure. Mm -hmm. And a lot of structure, or some structure anyway, is helpful to people. Um, uh, when they are beginning any kind of nutritional program because there is so much noise about diet that people feel lost. And so one thing combined with another gives you a way to eat. Um, and because it, we have lost a lot of family cues and community cues and social cues and even cultural cues about how to eat, I think they are there are ways of organizing a meal that uh, uh, that some people find attractive. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and there are some nutritional uh, and biochemical differences that, that I think are important, um, but don't necessarily have to do with trying to segregate foods. For example, if you, um, having protein with every meal, or having a source of protein with every meal, whether it's soy or chicken or fish or lentils or um, cheese, is important because it slows down the release of um, insulin from any other carbohydrates in the meal, um, as does a little bit of healthy fat. So um, if you have 
a piece of toast in the morning, and that's the breakfast, then your what will happen is that your blood sugar will go way up, your insulin level will go way up. Insulin acts as a fat storage hormone. You'll pack on fat, uh, you'll hold on to fat around the waist, especially if you're a man, and either the waist or hips if you're a woman, depending on how you're built. And and you will feel hungry in about an hour and a half. Um, uh, but if you have a little bit of almond butter on that toast, or some chicken on that with that toast, or you have um, avocado and lime uh, on that toast, you will lower the glycemic index of that toast. You'll have their blood sugar will go up more slowly and gently, or maybe not so much at all, because the digestion of those, um, both that healthy fat from the avocado and from and the protein from the chicken or almond butter is um, uh, tells your body that there's more to it than the toast, and it, it can reliably use its hormone system to um, to help you digest normally. So I do think that protein in every meal is important, and I do think that that if that counts as food combining, then I'm for it. Hmm. Could you give me one word or two words on your thoughts on the food pyramid? Uh, the the most recent addition of choosemyplate.gov um, is better. It's uh, more sensible. It's, it puts fruits and grains and vegetables and protein on the same plate. It puts dairy on a side plate. Um, if it were my plate, I'd probably switch the position of uh, grains and dairy. But I think it's a, a really nice, clear demographic and a big improvement over the previous food pyramid. Hmm. Well, it's time to check that food pyramid out. I haven't looked at a food pyramid in a long time. <laughs> yes, yeah, used to make fun of it a lot, and um, we still make fun of it. But it's it's got it's so much simpler. First of all, it's not a pyramid anymore; it's a plate, hmm. and it's divided into quarters: uh, fruit, grain, protein, and vegetables. With vegetables actually being about thirty percent, and fruits being about twenty grains and protein being split by half. Uh, wow. And it's very kid-friendly, too. I think um, that's where we're seeing a lot of improvement. Um, uh, I think school gardens are terrific. Kids are getting a great introduction. Many kids are just starting to learn this. And there's a wonderful data to suggest that uh, obesity in the two- to five-year-old group is now flat and actually declining. Oh, God. Um, um, New York City has done an amazing job with this and for children. Uh, and, and many, many other communities are doing similar work. I think it's a very exciting time to be in this field because uh, we just more and more have the feeling that food can be good medicine too mm -hmm. and taste as good as, as it ever has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, I do believe that, that people are appreciating fresh foods and a lot more because 19 years ago when I started to go to the farmer's markets here, you know, living in Asia, you walk down the street and it's open market. Almost every two blocks you can, you know, run into a market where you buy your fresh meat and fish and vegetables right there on the streets. You know, in North America, it used to be the grocery stores, and now the farmer's markets have just pulled in such a popularity now where people are really enjoying going out there and buying the freshest of the fruit and vegetables. You know, the, the first run of all the, the season's best really comes into the markets and it's so busy now. It's wonderful to see. It's marvelous diversity. I love being in farmer's markets. There are eight farmer's markets here in Santa Barbara a week and I actually give tours of them to people who are interested uh, and it's just a lot of fun to to know farmers and to be involved in growing. But the good news is that that farmer's market movement, which I've loved for decades as well, has now sort of uh, really over the last five years uh, um, prompted many traditional supermarkets to improve their own selections of organic and mm -hmm. locally produced produce. Yes. Uh, so much so that I think that um, we're seeing greater diversity uh, in Vons and Albertsons and Safeway and 
Kroger and um, and so many more. And that's terrific because I think it, it makes um, fresh food available in ways that it hasn't. And of course, the ability to penetrate into food deserts is an even more promising move. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I John, I like to ask each of my guests uh, for a health tip based on your own experiences and your knowledge and your expertise in your field. Do you have something for us? Yes, eat colorfully. Try to have color on your plate and try to sit while you eat and make sure that you really savor your food because savoring your food and learning to cook, I think, are as crucial as the clinic. Well, John, that was really great. Uh, we learned a lot from you, and I know that there are many more questions that we have for you uh, that are out there, and I'm looking forward to maybe doing another show in the future. Uh, so I would like to thank you very much for helping us all today. We wish you well in all your new adventures that should be up and coming. Christina, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, and uh, we look forward to speaking with you soon and going to the farmer's market. Anytime. Thank you.